Hey, what's up everybody? Daniel here from Never Enough Tech. Today we dig deep into the JBL Bar 9.1. A thousand dollar, wait for it, 5.1.4 soundbar system. Yes, not even close to a 9.1 system for those of you that didn't already know. As the JBL Bar 5.1.4 is maybe not a really cool sounding brand or an obvious enough upgrade from its predecessor, the JBL 5.1, JBL took liberties and added the five in front and the four in the back and went ahead and invented nine as their marketing number. Not the most forthright way of promoting your product, but nonetheless, I wanted to clear this up early to avoid those commenters with twitchy fingers. You fool, it's not a 9.1. I got you commenters. Anyway, let's jump in, shall we? And put this puzzle together. Keep in mind, I'm just a one man show, so I do make mistakes. If you're really interested in this product, maybe check the description for any updates or corrections. What comes in the box? Our soundbar, two rear surrounds, a subwoofer, wall mounting hardware, remote with batteries, a high speed HDMI cable, and your typical documentation, manuals, and warranty information. You do have a one year standard warranty with this bar. Feel free to watch my unboxing video if you really want to cozy up to this system. Everyone's doing it. Size and weight. The soundbar is compact by our very, very modern standards. Being only 34.8 inches wide, 4.7 inches deep, and 2.4 inches tall. It's just eight pounds, which is quite light. And on a personal note, it's made it much easier to move around in my hobbit hole down here. I am building a new house. The basement will be much taller. So I will be leaving this oppressive space. Though I am stressing out because I do not know where I will place my sparkle trees. These surrounds, which are detachable, are quite different from their peers. Not so much in footprint, euphemism for butt, but in height. These surrounds, as they are more or less an extension of the sound bar, are as short as the bar. Maybe this is obvious, but this is not how it works with other surrounds, which tend to be as tall, I suppose, as they need to be. Let's take a leap and say the competitor's surrounds are a bit more statuesque. The subwoofer makes up for the bar's missing mass. Well, by being 25 pounds, so a hardy toddler, but far more useful. The footprint is one by one foot and the top of the sub stands 17 inches high. You know, so about eh, this high. Yeah, it's close enough. So fun fact, the sub is well over twice the combined weight of the sound bar and the surrounds together. So a little lopsided in terms of weight distribution. I only have one of these, I'm trying here. Setup and speaker arrangement. Setup was a simple plug and play. Though simmer down and keep the surrounds on the bar during the initial plug-in. Once the bar is initially plugged in, you will be immediately prompted by the bar to set up Wi-Fi. The system can function without connecting to the internet, but if you want to establish a Wi-Fi connection, use Google Home. If everything is functioning normally, you should see Setup JBL 9.1 as a prompt on the top of the screen once you open it. It's step-by-step -step from there. Once you've established a Wi-Fi connection, you may get an auto update so maybe have a snack handy. Here's how JBL demands you position your speakers. Bossy. I don't know, if your ceiling is not 10 feet, go sit in the corner and feel bad, I guess. This is the way the world works. I'm not your mom. Build quality and design. The subcasing is made of medium density fiberboard or MDF. This material seems to be a near standard amongst these soundbar kits to attenuate rattle. The speaker is on the bottom of the sub and it does look pretty sharp as I mentioned in the unpacking video. Anyway, I think putting the sub on legs does help with the aesthetics a bit. The bottom of the legs do have a rubber coating that does help to absorb vibrations. It keeps it stable and promotes a more premium feel when placing it on a surface. I'm telling you, great products are made in the details. The soundbar and surrounds are cased in sturdy plastic and have your average nondescript metal grill. So nothing astounding from a material standpoint. A more subtle design point is the slight curve on the top of the bar where the convention seems to be flat. So this perhaps adds just a hint of differentiation to the look or just serves to obscure more of your TV screen. And you were probably thinking the rounded top was useless. Also perhaps worth noting is that the soundbar and surrounds both have built on rubber strips for vibration management and stability. I say this because with some bars, you have to apply these manually, like it's arts and crafts day. 
It's a small detail, but a point of differentiation. But you know, all these details pale in the wake of JBL's major design choice, removable, magnetically connected surrounds. So yes, the surrounds can live on the bar, or I don't know, over there somewhere, on a tabletop, behind you on the couch, are mounted to a stand or wall. Since the surrounds can be taken on and off the bar, you have this somewhat odd gaping magnetic port on the ends of the bar and surrounds. Obviously, it's a little odd to have a product designed to be in a state where it looks exposed or unfinished. For some markets, caps for these ports are provided. The package I bought, yes, bought, not given, did not include these caps. I live in the USA. I think not providing these caps to everyone kind of diminishes the aura of the product a bit. The magnetic connection along with other design details enables a very firm bonding between the surrounds and the bar such that you don't really need to worry about the surrounds falling off. It takes a bit of a horizontal tug to get a dislodge. I would say these surrounds are engineered to sit on an end table like a sandwich or the end of a sofa, like a sandwich. I think they look a little odd sitting on a mount or on your wall, given their Panini design language. If you don't have end tables, perhaps this would give you some pause if you're courting this product. All that being said, however, it is worth noting that there is a micro USB port near the magnetic connector so that they don't perish if you decide to permanently separate them from the mothership. Speaker array. The whole party brings 820 watts a pure fun. The bar by itself is 400 watts and is a 3.0.2 speaker. So we have our center left, center, and center right channel. That gives us our three. The center left and center right are both comprised of a woofer plus tweeter duo. The center channel has two woofers and a tweeter. For reference, the ARC, the SN11RG, the Q90R, and the Q950T the four other soundbars I've reviewed, I'll put two woofers and a tweeter on all three of these center channels. You do have upward firing speakers on the top left and top right, which are each a single woofer. So just for reference, on the bar, the JBL has two fewer tweeters and four fewer woofers than the Q950T. So don't be surprised if these two bars, the two that y'all wanted compared the most, sounds a little different. The surrounds are 60 watts each with an upward firing woofer and a forward firing tweeter. The sub is 120 watts and has a single 10 inch driver. Ports, you got six of them all lined up. Power, USB, optical, ethernet, your eARC and pass through HDMI. USB for most of the world is just an update hole, but for the US market, it can also play MP3s. And that concludes my list. I was not able to get MP3s to play via USB. As far as I can tell, no one actually tried it because I'm not seeing any testimonials on their experience. I don't want to delay this darn video anymore. If I figure it out from a commenter or some other way, I'll write instructions in the update section of the video description. Optical does not support 3D sound nor lossless surround audio. So don't use that one unless your TV does not have an ARC port. The ethernet port is just for establishing a better network connection. There is not really a mechanism to browse a NAS for instance. EARC is the two-way communication port between the bar and TV. An EARC or enhanced audio return channel is a juiced up variant of the plain old audio return channel. EARC has something like 37 times the bandwidth of plain old ARC and is capable of passing uncompressed audio. Anyway, with an ARC EARC connection to the TV's ARC port, the TV can send audio signals to the bar, as you would expect, or the bar can send video signals to the TV. Very fancy. So the latter happens if you use this HDMI pass-through port. The reason you would want to use this port is, well, you want to get your sweet uncompressed sound, say from a Blu-ray without your TV screwing it up. See, the thing is, while many TVs have an ARC port, many TVs are not eARC enabled. So if you plug, let's say the Blu-ray player directly into the TV, the TV will downgrade the audio signal before passing it along to the bar. That's not a good thing. That's bad. That's a bad thing. Probably worth noting that JBL will pass Dolby Vision and HDR10+, if you're into that kind of thing. You will find all the ports in one place and pointing straight back. I point this out because sometimes they are a bit more distributed throughout the bar. Power may be off in a separate jurisdiction somewhere. 
And they are not always on the back, so sometimes on the bottom, nor pointing back, so maybe off to the side. Some think bottom and side is the best way to go. So as simple as it seems, some soundbar makers do find a way to screw it up. I do think that JBL has provided a friendly arrangement in this case, if you plan to not mess with the ports very often. Should note that if this bar is mounted to the wall, the natural flow would be to route the cables through the wall and the ports would not be terribly accessible. Inputs. The bar can get audio from the TV, a Bluetooth connection, the HDMI pass-through, or a Wi-Fi connection via AirPlay or Chromecast. Okay, also USB, but it is not totally clear how to make that work. The manual is zero help there. The only explicit inputs are TV, Bluetooth, and HDMI pass-through. These are the three that are available on the remote and bar input toggle. I am sad to report that the JBL 9.1 does commit one of the greatest soundbar sins, handing the sound back to the TV when you go to a non-video source, so a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi connection. I think it's fair to say that virtually all of us don't want the TV sound to be playing alongside a song or podcast. So do what you have to do so the TV thinks you are still listening, even if you are ignoring it. Don't just cut the TV off hurting its feelings so it defaults to TV speakers. Ignoring these kinds of details are the fundamentals of a mediocre product. This is my second time recording this section because the first one didn't record right. So if I look a little dead inside, you know why. Supported audio formats through the ports. I know I have different kinds of viewers, so I wanted to take a moment to talk 3D sound, provide some clarification. If you already know everything about 3D sound, go ahead and skip to the next section. So for those of you new to the 3D sound scene or have no idea what I mean by 3D sound, let me unravel the mystery a bit. 3D sound is the next generation surround sound technology that attempts to make it sound like you are in the middle of the action, tricking you into thinking that sound is coming from everywhere as in real life, as opposed to a discrete set of speakers, which is what you get with traditional surround sound. Not to get too technical, but with 3D sound, speakers beam separate parts of the same sound object, so let's say falling rain, and bakes or renders that falling rain in real time and in locations not necessarily occupied by speakers. So anyway, 3D sound has been around for a while, but it's typically only really been attempted with a traditional home theater setup, with big speakers hanging from the ceiling, etc. Sound bars, which are much easier to set up than a traditional home theater system, are now trying to deliver 3D sound as well, enabled by higher end processing power and upward firing speakers that are meant to bounce sound from the ceiling mimicking ceiling mounted speakers. If you want to know the number of upward firing speakers a soundbar has, look at the last number here. This bar, the JBL 9.1, with its four upward firing speakers, supports the two major 3D audio formats, Dolby Atmos and DTSX. Most of you will be dealing with Atmos as that is the 3D format streaming services offer. And from my informal survey of my Blu-ray collection, the most popular 3D format for physical media. All right, back to your regularly scheduled program. Supported audio formats through the ports. For music via USB, you got MP3. 1997 paged and wants you to call it so 1997 can get its favorite music format back. For video audio playback, it's kind of interesting. Though not explicitly stated in the manual, JBL supports the full suite more or less. So you got Dolby Digital, Dolby Digital Plus, Dolby True HD. So both Dolby Digital Plus and Dolby True HD both support Atmos. Dolby's 3D audio format, but only True HD delivers the uncompressed creme de la creme Atmos. You also get DTS, DTSX, that's DTS's uncompressed 3D audio format, DTS Neural X, which upscales legacy tracks to be more DTSXy. Don't steal that. And DTS HD Master Audio. And the bow on top is 5.1 PCM support. Maybe keep in mind only Dolby Digital and DTS Basic are supported via optical. Optical does not support 3D sound. Why are you still using optical? Controls, you'll find controls on the bar and on the remote. So you come here for the insights. I have not found a dedicated app yet. Maybe look under your pillow or in some dusty box in your garage. On the bar, you have a single rubber strip covering four clicky controls, including power, volume down, volume up, and input. On the remote, you got a power button, quick input selections so you can just press TV 
where the bar takes sound from the TV, Bluetooth, or HDMI 1. You have general volume and a mute button, and you can independently affect the prominence of the upward firing speaker, Atmos, the sub, bass, or the rear ear level channels, rear. The display. JBL did not implement anything fancy here. There's a single tone LED display on the front in between the center and center right channel. It gives you information on volume, sound modes, input, surround speaker state, and audio format. And not just 3D confirmation, but whatever you're playing. So that should be a delightful detail for many of you. JBL's got nothing in terms of integrated content partners, but they certainly make up for this with their device to bar streaming support. With this bar, you have AirPlay 2, Chromecast, and Bluetooth 4.2. JBL maybe twisted their ankle on the dismount by not supporting Bluetooth 5.0. But nonetheless, lots of options for you. For those of you who are unfamiliar, AirPlay 2, for all practical purposes, allows you to play any audio stream on your device to the bar. So just like Bluetooth in that sense, but much better in terms of audio quality and does not have the same kind of physical distance tether. One very, very, very minor downside is that it's only supported on Apple devices. Chromecasting, which can be done on both Apple and Android devices, requires the specific content provider to play along and support. Luckily, there is no shortage of supporting apps, including the big guy Spotify, but not Apple Music or Prime Music. Voice assistance. Well, since there is no support, I'll just ask you to buy my CubeSnap apps, which can solve all of these cubes. Make your kids look stupid. Sound control. Well, you have the power button that can double as the mute button. Though JBL does give you finer control over the volume with these buttons here, pressing this one with the plus adjusts driver output in such a way that with each press, the volume gets a little louder. And the opposite seems to occur when you press the minus button. See, it can get pretty noticeable if you repeatedly press one of these buttons. And that about wraps it up. Okay, not quite, but your adjustment options are a little thin. As mentioned earlier, you do have some independent control over the subwoofer, the rear ear level channels, and the height level channels. The subwoofer has five levels to choose from. The rear and upward firing speakers, the latter being referred to as Atmos on the remote, have a low, mid, and high setting. Other than this, you have this buried smart mode function, which can be toggled on off with a three second mute hold and then a plus button press. Totally obvious. Smart mode, smart mode reportedly makes your audio effects sound more lush. So I think it's worth noting that JBL is more or less forcing you to go lush as smart mode defaults on every time the bar is turned on. Why? I should probably also mention that all audio will play as 5.1.4, whether stereo, surround, Atmos, you name it. This is actually not that strange of a decision. Sonos upscales everything and does not give the customer a choice about it. My guess is most customers don't think too much about this, but this bar forcing all audio to go 10 channels may concern those customers who lean more purist. Well, not to contradict myself, but music, typically formatted as stereo, is upscaled to 2.1.4, utilizing the center right, center left, sub, and all the upward firing speakers. Even at a high position, the upward firing speakers play much softer than the center left and center right, and just act to fill out the sound a bit. There is a night mode that reduces peak volume as not to disturb those who hate your big fat sound, presumably because they are lame or sleeping. To turn on night mode, press the mute button for five seconds and then the minus button to toggle. You have the option to toggle whether DTS Neural X is active, which is a DTS upscaling algorithm. Holding the Atmos button for 10 seconds will turn this on or off. Now, if you really wanna screw things up, Hold the base button for 10 seconds on the remote and then press volume up. Doing this, as far as I can tell, toggles you through a bunch of diagnostic modes that mostly seem to mute the dialogue main channel. This better not be what I'm thinking it is. What's that? A coup. Exchanging my brother with me. Run. Run. I truly honestly discouraged doing this as I was unable to really get the sound back to normal. When the dialogue came back, it had a horrible delay and it didn't sound quite right otherwise. In the end, I just threw up my hands and reset the system to make it work again. The only reason I could imagine that these modes were shipped is to help with tech support sessions. 
Otherwise, it just seems extremely sloppy to me that they would be included. A lot of interesting choices on JBL's part, but on the whole, it does come across as quite anti-enthusiast. I mean, even the Sonos Arc, which is perhaps the anti-enthusiast favorite soundbar, gives you basic EQ controls. JBL contemporaries, so Samsung and LG, give you a standard mode that allows you to play content without upscaling, and a handful of other sound modes that may be complementary to gaming, listening to music, etc. So, uh, maybe too minimalist. Auto calibration. Hold the HDMI button for five seconds, then have fun scaring your pets. Sound check. I'm gonna play sound samples from different audio formats, so find some headphones. I'll shut up now. Sound quality. So in this section, I'll be making a number of comparisons with the Q950T and some others. I will go ahead and say, yes, I know Samsung owns Harden, who owns JBL, so the Q950T and JBL are siblings, cousins, uncles and nephews, same family tree, share some DNA. Glad we got that covered. Bottom line, this is an impressive, lightweight, agile fighter. I mean lightweight literally, it doesn't weigh very much. This soundbar will be more than adequate for the vast majority of customers. It can create thunderous sound, and I found the 3D effect to be stronger, more convincing than average. Watching Jurassic World, a DTSX soundtrack, when in a crumbling cave, you definitely get the sense of rocks falling from the ceiling into your lap. And when watching Mad Max, you get no shortage of those off-angled, high-pitched directional buzzing sounds in the war scenes. So just about every scene. I'll give the JBL a bold check mark that it fulfilled its promise to deliver 3D sound, or at least sound that goes beyond typical surround. In some respects, even more convincing than the SN11RG. That being said, I, Daniel Glazer from Never Enough Soundbars, does not put this bar in terms of peak sound in the same league as the Q950T nor the Q90R. The sound on this thing, good golly, just doesn't hold the same weight and fullness. While it can get loud, you get not an overwhelming sense, but a noticeable twinge that is straining its vocal cords, where you can tell with a $600 more expensive Samsung bar that is more effortlessly delivering the same volume and with more substance. From afar, it looks like it's creating the same garment, but upon closer look, you see it's missing threads. JBL is cooking with skim milk, where the Qs are cooking with whole milk. So here's why I think I'm hearing this difference. JBL with the surrounds detached is not nearly as wide, 
leading to a narrower soundstage. I really don't think it's that difficult to tell the difference. So the bar is not only more narrow, it doesn't have the left or right nor wide angle channels that with the Q950T bounce sounds off walls, which act to further widen the perceived envelope of sound. Two of the center channels do not have the typical two woofer plus one tweeter trio. Instead, it's just a one woofer, one tweeter pair, which could in addition be leading to that Samsung light sound I'm hearing. You interrupted my recording session, buddy. Okay, say bye-bye. Bye-bye. And eight hours later, perhaps JBL tries to trick you into thinking it's an $1,800 soundbar by pairing the bar and surrounds with a really decent sub, where I do think the JBL maybe beats the Q950T. It is punchy, relatively precise, and provides that foundation that can maybe trick you into thinking this bar is punching at the same level. But if you listen, and perhaps not even that closely, and I know very few of you have the privilege slash burden of being able to put these bars right next to each other and listening to differences, I think you can pretty easily tell that the JBL doesn't have the size and drivers to match up. I mean, this bar here is something like half the weight of the Q950T. You might think that some of that extra weight you find on the Q950T may be dedicated to sound enhancements. The Revenant DTS HD Master Audio 7.1 sounds really great on the Q950T as I mentioned in my last soundbar video. You can really hear all those twig breaks and bugs, guns reloading and streams, separated and in fine detail. On top of this, the Q950T's width, along with the side speakers, helps to make the forest hug you, brings you in, it's engrossing. With the JBL, you don't have these same advantages and feel much more like you are watching the forest through the screen. While it doesn't reach the heights of the Samsung Q's, it does sound impressive in a smaller way. It reaches surprising volumes. It has an admirable 3D sound precision considering it's missing those left, right, and wide angle channels. The diminutive surrounds are pulling their weight. I think there are disagreements on this, but I felt the dialogue was fairly clean even in action sequences. I think it was pretty clear what the bear was saying. I might argue that the mid-level dynamics or fullness is lacking to some degree. I would compare the sound style here more to the Q90R, which I kind of consider a bulldozer. The Q950T, I've argued, brings a little more warmth, sweetness, and lift to the overall sound profile. Music, you thought I forgot. You know, I suspect for the vast majority of you, the music playback is just fine, or perhaps even a little better than fine. I think the sub picks up a lot of the slack, bringing a lot of the foundational precision. The knock here is going to be the mild, muddy, wooly, anemic mids that I suppose if you are being rather picky, leaves the music a bit hollow. You know, compared to a flagship Samsung or Sonos soundbar. It doesn't seem to have the same room saturating sound and is missing those directional channels on the bar. I did not find music playback grating like I did sometimes on the SN11RG. Though it's not tippy top notch, I describe the music playback as warm and inviting. Bottom line, I don't think you'll be disappointed with music playback. It's going to do a good job filling the background, giving your party some atmospherics, and it can just as easily be the center of attention if you want to turn things up a bit. Conclusions. All right, let me give this a shot. There are lots of things to like about JBL's flagship soundbar. The price is well below the competition. 600 if comparing to Samsung, 850 if comparing to Sonos, assuming you get the base and surround setup. It's a perfectly fine looking bar that avoids some of the unwieldiness of the more expensive bars like the SN11RG. It has a surprisingly good subwoofer that gives the sound a solid foundation. The 3D audio felt more convincing than average, honestly amongst the top of what I've tested so far. I was pretty surprised on this point. The sound stability was amongst the best that I tested. I didn't notice surround or soundbar dropouts, no matter the format or streaming box I threw at it. So unlike the Q950T, based on my week plus of testing, I'm not holding onto my seat, hoping a particular show may become unlistenable. It's something that has a life. As soon as you light that fire, you're committed. You can't switch. So moving on to the side of the coin that is different than the side I am currently on now. Top line, there is just a thinness, a strain, a stress to the sound that I just can't quite get over. In particular, if the soundtrack is not top notch. I talked about in detail why I think this is happening, at least relative to Samsung's Q line. I just could not get the voice out of my head that yeah, the other ones are a lot more expensive, but they sound more expensive too. 
If you're buying this bar for top-notch soundbar sound, you're not fulfilling your mission. Let's just be frank, comparing the size, weight, speaker count, drivers, channels, and range of channel directions, you could just about make this prediction without turning the soundbar on. I understand there are varying opinions on this soundbar on different popular sites, and there are objective measures that might refute my subjective experience. Nonetheless, I feel very confident many of you will come to the same conclusion I have on putting this bar against the top Samsung bars. I'd like to make it clear I made a point to develop my opinion on the sound before reading any formal reviews. Other aspects of the system that gave me pause was the bar constantly telling me that my surrounds were running low on power and needed to be connected to the bar. I got these messages even when the surrounds were plugged in via micro USB, and I did not get anywhere near 10 hours of playback after an all night charge on the bar before getting these battery warnings. At one point a surround that you would expect to be fully charged as it was on the bar all night, ran out of power, stopped playing sound, and had to be reconnected after about 30 minutes of playback. My particular bar sends out way too many orders on what I should be doing with the bar and how much power is left. From my perspective, this is all a non-starter, just keeping it real. I'm certainly not okay with how limited the sound controls are. I think at the very least there should be EQ control because default tuning just may not be for everyone. Each customer may have varying levels of sensitivity to different frequencies. The few sound controls you do have can only be unlocked with some sort of a Nintendo type button sequence that have very little rhyme or reason. Start auto calibration, turn off smart mode, turn on night mode, check battery levels, auto sync, turn off DTX neural upscaling, nor would you know that these functionalities even exist. I think every modern soundbar is probably being too cute if they think they can get away with not having a native app. Also, LPCM support, or at the very least the 5.1 variety, which should be a bragging point for this bar, does not seem to work as you would expect. Plugging the Apple TV directly into the bar stripped Netflix of any Atmos tags. Also, I sensed that dialogue under this condition got dunked into water, oddly muffled. War criminal, why are you protecting him? My client has not ordered any gas attacks. No, he's ordered the... I did not get those annoying dropouts, but I got an odd degradation in overall audio quality, compared to say streaming directly from my smart TV. That as far as I'm concerned, thirds the value of the Apple TV. Apple TV is a popular streaming device, but I'm not recommending it get used with this bar. Streaming from my LG C9 worked perfectly, as did plugging my Samsung 4K Blu-ray player directly into the bar. Though, plugging my Blu-ray player directly into my eARC-enabled TV led to no sound from the surrounds. Plugging the Blu-ray player back into the bar, the surround sound came right back. To clarify, these specific problems do seem to be unique to this specific bar. God knows I've spent ample time pointing out bugs on the Q950T. I also want to point out that DTS did not seem to perform at the same level as Dolby. The sound was more constricted, a little smaller. I felt this to be true on the Q950T as well. Overall, there is a pattern of undesirable weirdness that I have yet to kind of fully unravel and, well, leaves me a little down on this bar. Buying advice, who might this bar be right for? Well, those that meet a lot of these criteria. If you're on a budget, don't use an Apple TV. You have an eARC-enabled TV as plugging directly into the bar or plugging directly into the TV can lead to odd audio results. Good to have flexibility. You plan on playing a lot of music through this bar. You have limited space and maybe have a TV in the 40 to 50 inch range. You want to dramatically augment your TV speakers, but don't need peak soundbar sound. You believe moving surrounds from bar to side table hundreds or thousands of times sounds more like a treat than a chore. If this doesn't really sound like you, well, maybe I'd skip this particular bar. Thanks for watching. Catch you on the next one.